And it's uh, my pleasure to welcome you to our first uh, program that we've done at Lincoln Center, actually, and our first by necessity then at LCT3. Uh, some of you probably know I spent the better half of my life uh, about 350 feet south from here at the New York State Theater dancing, so it's always a pleasure to be back on campus. Uh, the last years I've spent producing, directing things for the stage, but also working on initiatives in arts policy, and very specifically, working to find ways that the arts can be of benefit to society in all ways that we can find, and to amplify those, those methods, to highlight them, to replicate them where possible. And this program in particular is one I'm extremely proud to bring here to Lincoln Center Theater. Uh, this is all about the use of theater in prisons right now, in youth incarceration, in adult incarceration, and in the bigger picture of rehabilitation through the arts. Uh, I asked uh, my friend from the Washington Post, Phil Kennicott, to moderate this because he is a singular voice in, to, in today's world about how the arts operate in our society. Again, from the stage to education to veterans affairs to incarceration. Uh, Philip has a way of uh, understandingly exposing ourselves. Uh, so I asked him to be the moderator for this. He previously helped me with the veterans program uh, with Arthur Bloom's Music Corps and also with Story Catchers Theater, uh, with Mead Palodowski's Story Catchers from Chicago, uh, which works in youth incarceration for 30 years. I met Mead a few years ago doing some work on education in Chicago. I was tremendously moved by what she does. Uh, and last summer, she came to Aspen to talk about her program, along with the young woman, Angelica Garcia, who you'll meet uh, in, the, in this program uh, this evening, who is, I guess you could call a graduate. Uh, she's someone who can tell you firsthand what this program does and how it can change lives. Uh, we also have, from the Actors Gang in California, uh, Sabra, who actually founded that portion of the Actors Gang, the Work in Prisons, the Prison Project. Uh, she works with Tim Robbins in uh, stints in California prisons. They are poised to expand dramatically, which I think is exciting. When you think of things that are working, these are things that are expanding. Uh, so she'll tell us about those challenges. Uh, and for now, I just want to say again, it's a pleasure to be here. And really the idea of talking about theater in prisons in one of the world's great theaters, in Lincoln Center Theater, really brings home to the point that it's all about citizen artistry. It's not simply arts and artists. It's not simply citizenship and good work. These things come together in magnificent ways when we allow them to and when we encourage them to. So Phil, I'm going to get out of, my, out of the way and just say thank you to Lincoln Center Theater and Andre Bishop, my old friend, uh, for hosting us this evening. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Damien. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I guess this is my Lincoln Center debut. Um, <laughs> and thanks for making the introductions to Sabra, Angelica, and me. You know, as, a, as an arts critic, I tend to write about art in one very particular aspect. It's the sort of art that happens in places like this, or the sort of art you see at the Metropolitan Museum or MoMA. Um, very rarely do I get a chance to write about art in service of something art as healing, art uh, being used in prisons, in the penal system. Um, and one might think that there's a very big difference between the two of them. But as I've done these panels that Damien has organized, including one he mentioned with Arthur Bloom, who works with grievously wounded veterans, teaching them music, what I've realized is that the very things that make performances exciting or make exhibitions very exciting or in fact, there's a continuum with what's going on in the kind of work that Story Catchers um, and the Prison Project is doing. Um, these programs work because they're about discipline, they're about sort of self-exploration, they're about stepping outside of oneself, they're about taking risks. And it's fascinating to see how just the kind of dynamics of making art really travels from one place to another, from a prison in Illinois, from the prisons of California, to places like Lincoln Center. So I thought I'd start with Sabra, just to get a sense of the, of the two programs so people know um, the kind of work you're doing. You come from London to Los Angeles, and you, you joined the Actors Gang. This is Tim Robbins' group. Um, and yet you see a need there for something beyond just being an actor within that company. What, what were you thinking at that point? Well, it was really the work that made me realize that, um, I don't know if people know, but the Actors Gang is a theater company that's 33 years old that Tim and some other actors founded out of UCLA. And the work is very socially conscious, 
controversial, challenging uh, form of theatre. And when I started working in that way of working, every Sunday the whole company gets together and does a workshop, an improvised workshop. So when I did that for a few months, I really felt, wow, this work is having such a profound effect on my life in terms of holding a mirror up to my own life in a very unexpected way that I thought, oh, well, this, you know, they must have a great prison program. They <laughs> must be doing this as rehabilitation. So I went to Tim and I was like, I really want to be part of your prison program. And he was like, I don't know what you're talking about. We don't have one. <laughs> Please go ahead and make one. So it was really um, the work and has, has continued in the last eight years to always be based on the stage. So like you're saying, you know, we're in a theater. It's not that far from, you know, the work that we do in prison. For us, it's, you know, inextricably linked. I'm an actress still. I'm still working. We're practitioners. We're not theorists. So it's a very important thing for us. And, and the, the particular um, way in which you're working in the theater is with the Commedia dell'arte. And that, that's really interesting, because one, one might imagine this is a fairly stylized form of theater, mm -hmm. maybe in a kind of old-fashioned theater. But how have you adapted that then into uh, the prison program? Yes, so the style of Commedia dell'arte, which is 600 years old, it's a European style of theater um, that together still with the Greeks you see everywhere. You might not realize it, but a lot of our theater, and even film and TV, is based on Commedia stock characters. So. Our style of Commedia is kind of a bastardized version. <laughs> it's not very pure. We got it from uh, Théâtre du Soleil in Paris. And um, it's extremely highly emotional and physical form of theater. We wear masks. So we either wear a physical mask, a leather mask, or we wear white face that creates the mask. And in prison, usually, we wear white face because the actual mask is quite advanced play. So. Um, yeah, it's a very crazy thing to do. <laughs> when we first started and I called prisons before anybody knew about the work and I was like, hey, would you like us to come to your prison and put makeup on your guys and do, you know, <laughs> four hours of what we call the theater of sweat with no breaks? They were kind of like, whoa, that's so crazy that you should just come and try it. So, you know, I mean, that's really how it works. And it's, it's even Tim and I, and Tim's been doing the work for, you know, 33 years had no idea how profoundly it would help to transform these people's lives and you know, give them tools to manage their emotional lives and develop empathy, take responsibility, all these things that you would hope that the arts can do for people and were doing for me really worked with this particular population. And what is it about the, the Comedia dell'arte in particular? That, you know, it, reducing these characters to archetypes and reducing the emotions to kind of very, you know, stark, you know, elemental emotions. Why is that useful? What, what role does that serve um, within the, the, the prison? Yeah, that's a good question. I'm still not 100% sure, <laughs> but it just, I know that it works on such an incredibly profound level. And I think that one of the things with our work is that we don't know their crimes. We're not asking them. They've already been judged. We don't need to judge them. We're just there. As human beings, and I, I like to work with a completely clear, straight road to the person that I'm teaching. So I don't want my own judgment and, oh, here's the murderer, here's the rapist. I don't need to know any of that. We just see another human being. They get to play these characters, so we're not asking them about their own life, because we're not therapists, we're artists. And um, they get to exercise and also exorcise these big emotions that often are the reason for them being in prison, because they weren't able to control them. But they get to do it through this character. So through the old miser, or the young lover, or you know, the maid, or you know, all these different comedia stock characters. And they get to make relationships with other people. And the amazing thing in our theater is that there's no fourth wall. So when we play, we look directly into people's eyes mm -hmm. in an available emotional state. And that in prison is like the biggest no, no, because if you look in someone else's eyes and they misjudge you, you can get killed. So it's a you know, survival technique. So we're asking them in full makeup, playing these characters, to look directly in someone's eyes in a highly emotional state. And what happens is that they start, it starts to hold a mirror up to them and they start to break down their formerly held conceptions, especially about other gang members. California's the worst for you know, gang violence. So you have, you know, a northern, northerner, you know, northern Mexican gang with a, 
crip or a white supremacist, and by the end of the eight or ten week session, they always say, these guys are more my brothers than my gang, or my sisters, when we work with women. Right. I mean, your, your group is not working with Camila Del Arte. Um, <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> Don't worry, no one no. else is either. <laughs> but you're, you're developing stories out of the, the lives of the, of the young women. We are. With. We do personal storytelling, and we actually use the process of telling the personal stories um, to help kids to look at their environments and their relationships, the, um, their choices that they're making and the consequences of their choices. And what's happened to us over the years is that we've figured that almost all the stories that we get are trauma stories. Um, they're about being abused, being you know, raped, um, seeing people murdered on the street. Um, and we don't always ask for those stories, but that's what people go back to. And so actually, an, after an accumulation of those kind of stories for some years, I've been doing this for 30 years, and since 1990 in the prisons. And so it struck me that, you know, because no matter what the writing prompt would be, you go into a storytelling session and you would give a writing prompt, and it could be telling the truth or war and peace, what, whatever the prompt was. And a lot of times you get the same kind of, everybody would go back to that the big trauma, you know, and a lot of these kids have been sort of serially traumatized, so they have experienced a lot of trauma. Um, but usually there's some seminal trauma that they go back to, and so we realized that this was something that we need to, needed to deal with, and actually I went and studied with a trauma therapist for a year. Um, when I was on a fellowship so that we could compare the, um, our, the process that we were doing as artists to complex trauma therapy and found that it actually contained all of the same elements. And so the patterns of the stories are frequently the trauma that they have experienced as a child and then the emotional reaction that they have which is largely anger and depression and then from there, because you're angry and you're depressed, you drop out of school, you join gangs, you stop doing positive activities, you find the other angry kids, and eventually you commit a crime and you end up incarcerated. And the system does not really help you to find that trajectory, you know, the, that dramatic arc of that you were traumatized and these other things happened and then you committed a crime and here you are. But, so through the process of the playwriting, the producing, and the acting, you can follow that arc, and you can own that arc, and you can you know, take responsibility for it, you can understand it, and therefore you can create a new future, because you have seen why you made choices and where you're going. And so, we take all the stories, we do a year-round program, and we do two sets of story writing, and then we, do, we take all those stories, and we make composite characters with kids, and we create a, a musical theater script. And one of the reasons we use musical theater is that it's really a great form for telling multiple stories, because you can use a musical chorus that's about going home, and you can tell three or four or five stories about going home at the same time and wrap it in music. Um, so then we do a full production at the end of the year. Um, we work with both males and females, and we've been very lucky because there's been a major transformation um, in Illinois from the Department of Corrections Juvenile Division to the Department of Juvenile Justice. And so it's a much more forward-thinking um, department, and the girls travel to see the boys' shows, the boys travel to see the girls' shows. Um, we're allowed to take them out to professional theater, so that's kind of amazing. We go to the Goodman, <laughs> we'd, we'd, we'd see all you know, the, the big theaters in Chicago, generally they're because they have matinees and the kids have to go to matinees. But so there's just a lot of things happening. Um, well, you, you mentioned that, um, that uh, you had just actually finished the big production of the year. Um, <laughs> maybe it would make sense to actually get a, a sense of the work in Angelica's going to do a performance. Yeah. Um, just to set this up, this is from not the most recent um, no. performance, but this is from a time when you yourself were participating, right, in Story Catchers? Yes, this is actually um, based on a perf performance that I helped write and um, perform in in 2009. 2009, okay. Yes. Well, why don't you and I give them some room and um, take it away.
Violence is everywhere. It's just the way it is. In my city, people die every day. It's like a storm. It's always hanging over us. But just like lightning, you don't know when or where it'll strike. In 2009, I'm incarcerated at the Illinois Youth Center in Warrenville, Illinois, for violating probation. I meet Ms. P and I join Storycatcher's Fabulous Females group. My journey over the next four years as I'm incarcerated and reincarcerated, released, and put on parole begins with a story of my life on the streets of Chicago. My guys and I are driving. So busy getting high, we don't even realize we already deep in the south side. That's when we notice on our left a car full of guys. I turn to Yak, peep these flakes. Yak turns to monkey, flag them, D. We start forking the other car. They flag us back, rolling down the window, yelling, D, K, D side, Bo. We speed up and sideswipe them. Bam, metal against metal. We're racing as we exit the E-way, still following them. At 79th and Harlem, we see a cop. Both of our cars slow down. The cop passes. We switch lanes and ram them from behind again. Dragon killer, they speed up. We smash them again. They roll down their window. Dragon, a brick comes sailing through our rear glass and lands right by my feet. Pee Wee throws a crowbar at them. Their car is already banged up. They pull over. For a split second, I think, they had enough. Then the driver hops out of the car. He pops the trunk. Cherry ass Pee Wee, y'all ain't got the thing? Nah, not even. Let's break. Hell yeah, back to the hood where it's good. We cruise up Oakley and right on 23rd, we come to a stop because we peep one of the folks. G Lo lowers the windows. Munchies, what's good, D? Nothing, just chilling, D. I can't stay in the crib anymore and I'm a little tore up. Damn, folks, you just got out of boot camp about a month ago, nah? Yeah, like three weeks ago, barely. As Munchies leans on one side, I notice that the clean, fresh white tee he's rocking has stains on it just below the collar. So either folks is a messy eating or you slap, D. <laughs> Everybody starts laughing. He's cheesing from ear to ear. A refreshing break from so many of the hard and bitter guys in this neighborhood. He's cute too, only a year older than me. Skinny, dark tan skin and exotic features. His ears are kind of big, but in a cute way. Well, we finna ride out, folks. You wanna ride? Nah, I'm cool. It looks like y'all packed anyway. We all know there's no room in the car. Munchies knows it too. So you just gonna leave my folks out there like that? Yak is angry. Nah. You strapped the Pee Wee asks Munchies. Nah, he gets real quiet. Then we got you, D. We gonna get you something to be out here on patrol with. g -Lo starts to drive off. We'll be back in five minutes. But not even five minutes later, Stax taps g -Lo. Turn down the radio. You hear that? You hear gunshots? He cuts the system. Damn, I hope Munchies went inside. Let's go back, folks. g -Lo yells. Hell yeah, hurry up, hurry up. Me and Cherry glance at each other, locking eyes. We know what's yet to come. When we get back to the corner, we expect to see him gone. I think they got him. We see Turtle's ride pull over next to Junior Sports Bar. An ambulance pulls up across the street from El Huero's. The paramedics run to the car with a stretcher. They drag Munchies out from the back seat. He's unconscious. His once white tee is now stained with blood. Ms. P encourages me to go deeper emotionally with the story, but I don't want to show anyone that I can be soft. I do sign up to become a playwright that summer, even though I'm having trouble dealing with one of the girl's stories. The invisible girl tells how Jessica's father, when she is just seven years old, gives her to a 57-year-old truck driver friend. He feeds her junk food and then rapes her repeatedly. Jessica comes home to her father and his friend laugh about it. 
When we read the story at a staged reading in the spring, all the girls cry, but not me. I approached Miss P in the hallway that summer. You know, I can't feel sorry for Jessica. If I feel sorry for her, I would have to feel sorry for myself. I lower my voice so no one can hear. See, when I was 15, there was this older guy from my neighborhood, Carlos. It was late and I needed a ride home from a party. Carlos says yes to the ride, but then turns down a dark alley that backs in the train tracks. He's bigger and he's heavier and he forces me. No one believes that it was rape, even though my parents took me to a hospital and a police station. At the station, the detectives ask my parents to leave the room. Then they tell me Carlos said, I told him I was 18 and that if I go to court, it will get real ugly. His lawyers will make it look like I was the one who wanted it. When my mom comes back into the room, the detectives hold out a paper and tell her to sign, dropping the charges. We do. As my sophomore year begins, I try to forget about it. I try to pretend everything is okay. But I find myself becoming more and more angry, enraged, really. I start smoking weed all the time, barely going to school anymore. My mom fights me and calls me a liar for saying I was raped. And then one day, I leave school early to go to McDonald's with some friends. We smoke some weed. I start having a real good time, acting silly, knocking hats off of strangers. I even run up to a freshman and steal his dog tag right off his neck. When I look down, I see it has a Cubs logo on it. <laughs> I throw it back at him. You can keep it. <laughs> the Cubs suck. All my girlfriends start laughing. Angie, you crazy. You wouldn't really take something from someone. Oh, I wouldn't? Hmm. Pick out any purse you see. Point the girl out, and I'll go get it for you. We see a girl walking with her friend about to walk right past us. Cherry says, that one, that one right there. I'll be right back. I start running toward the girls. Right before I get to the girl, I yank her purse from her shoulder. It falls to the ground. She turns around. I punch her in the face. It feels good. She reaches out to grab my hair, so I keep punching her in the face. I can't stop punching her. The girl falls on the ground, and we all start kicking her. It feels good to finally let my anger out. The next day, I'm talking to my friends in the lunchroom when I see the girl. She points me out to the police. They cuff me. You're being charged with strong arm robbery. This is the case I'm here on now, I tell Miss P. Miss P and I have a lot of conversations about the connections between my stories, how I felt, what happened to me, the choices I made, and how I'm locked up now. We talk about what happens when you leave jail and go home to the same neighborhood. Can you really make it and change your life? Go to college even, if you hang out with the same people? So our playwriting group creates a character, Marie Therese. We take the incidents that happened to me. We make Marie a ghost girl hanging between life and death after a shooting. We call the musical, if I cry for you. I am Marie Therese. I just got out of jail. I go to college downtown in the loop. One day, I'm running late for class. Desperate for a ride, I get in the car with some old friends. Only they don't turn downtown toward the loop. Where are you going? What are you doing? <laughs> they laugh and turn into the old neighborhood. Let me out, I'm gonna be late for class. As I'm running to the bus stop, I see him, Carlos, the guy who raped me. I stare at him, he stares back at me. I could tell he doesn't even recognize me, and this makes me angry. But because this moment did not happen in real life, because this isn't a play, and this is theater where we can make anything happen. Marie Therese gets to say everything I have wanted to say for years but couldn't. Carlos, look at me, look at me. 
How do you not know me? How could you sleep at night knowing what you did to me? You killed this little girl. I'll never be the same because of you. Chill. It was just a little sex. I was drunk. You shouldn't have gotten in the car with me, Shorty. Come on, tonight is different. Don't touch me. Don't you ever touch me again. I hate you, Carlos. I wish you would die. I wish you would die. You and your stinking body die and rot in hell. <sighs> I turn away and I'm left standing on the corner and suddenly all my anger is gone. And I'm just wishing my mom would love me again and be proud of me just like she was when I was a little girl before Carlos raped me and all we did was fight. So I reach in my pocket and I dig for my phone. Only I can't find it. Hey girl, what's that you reaching for? What you got right there? Answer me, girl. I finally get my phone out. I dial five for mom. And that's when I hear it. I hear gunshots. I look around to see where they came from. I see it's from Carlos and he's running away. And that's when I realize I've been hit. As I start to fall slowly, everything's turning black, except there's this girl and she's catching me. And I look in her face and it's her. It's the girl I beat over and over again. And in that very second, I realized this girl feels toward me the way I feel toward Carlos. I have wrecked her life the way he has wrecked mine. Oh my God, there's something wet in my eye. My stupid pride overwhelms me. No, 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 Marie Therese, you're not going to cry. Not today, not ever. If I cry for you, must I cry for me? If I take off the mask that says I don't care, do I have to feel sad for the girl revealed there? As my heart freezes up, I look at the girl stare down at me, at the single tear staining my cheek. If I cry for you, must I cry for me? If I take off the mask for the girl with no past, do I have to feel sorry for the girl in the glass? When I caught you, I was forgiving you. I still forgive you. I accept. If I cry for you, I must cry for me. Yes, I must cry for me. Thank you, thank you. Um, I've heard that once before last summer in Aspen, and it's still, it's still very powerful. Um, in the introduction of the piece, you, you said that it was after you were reincarcerated after parole violation that you joined Story Catchers. What got you to take that step at that point? Why at that point did you um, hook up with the group and, and begin this? Well, actually, um, I was sentenced to be in the Department of Corrections well, when I was 17. It was still Department of Corrections, not Department of Juvenile Justice in Illinois. 
But when I was 17, I was sentenced to be in the Department of Corrections, not to exceed my 21st birthday. So upon arriving at Warrenville, they told me to get, basically get comfortable. You're going to be here for a while. <laughs> and for me, I was very upset. Um, I was already in college. Um, I worked, and it's, I didn't have nothing to do now except watch TV and idle time. So when I heard that there was a musical theater program, I got excited right away. I just threw myself into it. I was eager to, I seen a performance that they, one of the, the prior groups had when I was coming in, and I was very impressed. And I said, well, this is, this is what I'm gonna be doing while I'm here. <laughs> and um, I, I was in every, in every session while I was incarcerated with uh, Fabulous Females. And, and you've, been, you've been doing this a number of times. In, in, in the piece, you have to basically talk about in front of an audience this incredibly dramatic thing that happened to you. Is it any easier now to do this than it was when you were creating this character um, in the beginning? Well, I think it's a lot easier to perform now because I'm um, very comfortable with the piece. I was a little nervous doing it here in New York. <laughs> 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 Done it in Aspen, in Chicago, but in New York. <laughs> so, yeah, it's, um, it's, it, it's upon um, performing it so many times, I've come to a lot of rela realizations within myself that I think you were talking about too. Then, and also what we, our process of, of, our creative process where we make our plays it really helps us reflect on our own choices and helps ultimately helps not just myself but a lot of, a lot of other girls who've participated in the program make better choices for their futures and right although what's a little bit different about this is that actually when the girls are locked up they never play themselves yes. you write the stories but you always trade roles so that you have the possibility of seeing your life on the stage and seeing the reactions of the other people in your life to what's happened. And we've had people you know, go like, oh my God, I didn't realize until I saw it, you know, I was screaming at my stepmother and they looked at the other actor reacting how much like, pain I caused her. Um, so the alums get to do their stories because <laughs> um, I think it's instructive. But when we do it, it's really about being able to take your life and your painful story and put it outside of yourself and make it about everybody because then somebody else steps into that role who's also had similar experiences and the other girls and then the audience can share that experience as a universal experience. It's interesting in the piece you talk about taking off a mask and, and so but one of the things that's so fascinating just from looking at the pictures that you may have in, in some of the material that you brought of the men in, in your program is that they're wearing this white makeup and this mask. Masks are functioning different ways here, I, I guess. How are they functioning in the program you're working with in the Comité de l'Arte tradition? Well, the inmates, men and women, and we've worked with juvie and at-risk kids as well, they always say putting this mask on allows me to take off the mask I've been wearing my whole life. So they find a real freedom in the mask. Um, and just the ability to go places that they feel like they wouldn't be able to go if I was like, hey, Brian, you know, play you and do this. And then we also have a writing aspect to our program. So kind of like what you could do, if they write a piece, we give it to somebody else usually to read. We deconstruct it. We take out words that, you know, strike people when they hear it. And then we create a new poem or a new piece from those words. So it becomes something that's part of the whole group. Right. So yeah, we do a lot of we do a lot of crazy things <laughs> with the, the inmates, yeah. But it's all I feel like um, you know what they often say at the beginning is, oh, I'm not gay, I'm not wearing makeup. So then we started calling it man cake, so it didn't sound like <laughs> you know you know. Um, and then they would be like, oh, okay, because they have to sign a contract about participation. One of the many things in our contract that they they sign. But then they know they have to do it if they want to be in the class. And also, why should this guy do it and you not do it? But the really big thing comes at the end of the session. So after eight or 10 weeks, we have an open workshop, which we call a final presentation, where they culminate. And they invite other inmates to watch. <laughs> and uh, it's extraordinary, because they're always so nervous about people seeing them in makeup. 
you know, their mask. But the reaction has every single time universally been like, oh my God, you guys are so brave. I want to do it. You know, we have a 200 person waiting list in one of the prisons. They really uh, respond so amazingly to the courage of these guys. It takes courage to do that in prison, you know. One of the common themes, I think, from talking with both of you is the notion of creating a safe place. Yeah. That that's sort of the beginning of the process. And you mentioned a contract. We also do contracts. So tell me, but maybe both of you just tell us a little bit, and, and Angelica would jump in. What makes a, a place safe to get this started? What mm -hmm. kinds of things have to be there? Well, the contract that we make is made up by the residents, mm -hmm. who they're not called inmates, or they're juveniles. Um, so they create rules for themselves that if you know, we're going to create a space where I can tell my story and feel good about it and not feel criticized or worry about it being taken back and told to everybody else, what rules do we have to make? And then they make the rules and then they sign the contracts. And then if they break those rules, you know, it's on the piece of paper saying, you know, you signed that contract and now, you know, and, then, and there's always the risk that if you do break a rule, you may be taken out of the, mm -hmm. of the workshop. Mm -hmm. What are your feelings about the, um, the detention center using the right to participate in the program as a, as a tool for enforcing discipline. Are they allowed to say, if you don't do X or Y, you can't go to no, story actually, pressures? What happened to us at Warrenville is that when we first got there, and it was the Department of Corrections, they only wanted us to use the level ones and twos, which are the higher behavior levels. And it took a while for us to convince them that, in fact, it was the level threes that needed the program more than the level one and, ones and twos. Um, because they needed the opportunity to get off the cottage and to work through their issues. And often, the girls that we had or the kids that we had would behave, we would never have a problem with them. You'd get you know, teachers and people saying, that girl never you know, does anything right, and she's always throwing things and this and this. And we'd like, be like, we, don't, we didn't recognize that. And so they would want to take them out and, because they were having issues elsewhere, and we convinced them that, in fact, if someone is doing well in you know, a session um, in a workshop that you should keep them in that and hope that that will spread to the other places. Yeah, and we have a similar thing with, uh, we call them agreements. So we ask them, what do you need in order to feel that you can do this work? And they'll say, I need to feel safe. I need to feel respected. I need to, people to participate. And then we ask them, okay, what does that look like? What's safe to you? And then we write everything down and, you know, we create a, a contract from it. And then also one of the important things that we've discovered in our class is we use certain language frames. So if they're watching other people's work, they're not allowed to say, oh, that's good or that's crap. Or, you know, they have to say, oh, I noticed blah, 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 or I observed this or that piece of work made me remember this thing. And we always try to get them to use I statements, you know, rather because the tendency is when you're trying to not take responsibility for your life, start talking about you. If it has to be mm -hmm. I, then everything starts to change. So, you know, the, the thing that people don't talk about very often in this kind of work is the, um, I hate the word victims, but the victims of crimes. So a lot of the victims of crimes are in prison. Mm -hmm. They're also the perpetrators. Um, and so the work we do is for the victims outside of prison as well as for the people who are in prison, also for their families and their friends. So we work with every level. We work with life without parole. There's a whole bunch of programs for nonviolent offenders. But the problem is, guess where the violent offenders are going? They're coming back here to us too. And they need more help than anybody. So by just you know, having nonviolent offenders in your program, you might have a really low recidivism rate. But what are you going to do about, the, you know, more than 90% are coming back to us. So we work with Life Without Parole. Half of our class are probably lifers. And we work from level two to level four, men and women. Right. We're getting to the point where we're going to open up for questions. But a couple things I really want to ask quickly. One, both of you um, are scaling up or at the point of really sort of expanding the programs. And, and I mean, tell me about where Story Catchers is going and, and what sort of a new clientele at this point is for. <laughs> well, for a very long time, we've had a vision about working with the youth as they get out of prison. And because there was a transition from the Department of Juvenile Justice, that was juvenile justice, but the kids were still in adult parole when they got out, which made it very difficult to work with because adult parole has 
all these rules, you know, about not breaking curfew and going to school and not doing drugs and not having fights with your parents and, and all the things that they are bound to do, so they're going to violate and then they get reincarcerated. And now there is a new system in Illinois which is called aftercare specialists, which makes so much sense because the aftercare specialist's job is to mentor the kids, to help them go to school, to help them have a job, to get them into counseling, to meet with the families all the way through their incarceration. So we are working with the aftercare specialists and we're starting a program called Changing Voices. Um, the other thing that occurred to us, because we would get a lot of youth that would come out and they want to work with us, but then um, because our community programs, you know, met on Saturdays and they didn't pay and that it, they all had to have jobs. And so it didn't really work out, especially if you get a low paying job, you have absolutely no control over your schedule. So we knew in forming a post-release program that it had to be a jobs program. And so we did a pilot last year um, for 18 weeks, which was funded by the Illinois Criminal Justice Information Authority, which is a mouthful. Mm -hmm. um, and we had 16 to 24 year olds, which we hadn't actually planned on having all the 20 somethings, but that turned out to be a, a really good thing. And so they, in our pilot, they created a show, um, which was just a first act where it we really brought it up to the point of everybody, of a, a climax with everybody's problems. And then in the discussion, the school groups, community groups would work out the choices that the characters would make and the kids got paid for it. And, um, and they were very skeptical because these actually, because it was the Criminal Justice Information Authority, they weren't necessarily the kids that we'd worked with on the inside. And so it took some time. It was, there were a lot of issues and it was, um, it was an amazing program though because uh, by the end, you know, it was the same thing that theater always does is that the group was a family, they were, you know, had each other's backs. They did come from different parts of Chicago, although we were in a south side um, violent area. Um, and, you know, they had a lot of substance abuse issues. They, some dealt with them. A lot of them went back to school. And after it was over, which made them very sad, um, because they wanted to stay with us forever, um, they went out looking for jobs together, you know, and they started to socialize together. And one of them actually just, I got permission for him to be in the show that we did in Warrenville, which was kind of amazing because he couldn't pass a background clearance. And I just said to Judy, who was the superintendent, well, if this is the future, you have to let them in. We have to be able to do that. And so it was, it was great. It was terrific. So this is what we are trying to do, which is to build a statewide program so that there would be in every judicial district in Illinois, there would be a theater group of these young people that get out. It would be a job and they would be mentors in their communities and they would lead these discussions and eventually some of them would be the leaders of the next groups and they would make careers out of it. Um, so in a sense, creating a, a longer sort of landing path for people coming out of the system well, so they have opportunities. Imagine to have, instead of no work and we can, you can't be hired because you have a felony on your record, then in fact, for our application, it asks you, you know, how many times did you offend? Can you give us, you know, and that's it's awesome. a good thing. Join us. <laughs> well, it actually, you know, but it's such a breakthrough for people who are afraid to apply yeah. for employment. Supper. So California had one of the sort of model penal systems until Not about 1980. <laughs> so what is, what is your group doing at this point? Um, California is, yeah, as you probably know, we've been sued by the feds a lot in California. Our prison system was three times overcrowded. Five years ago, they cut out arts and corrections of all prisons. There ended up being a couple of programs at San Quentin, one at Folsom and us in the whole state. Um, and then realignment came along where, we, because we were sued, we had to take a bunch of inmates out of prison, put them in county jails. So now county jails are overcrowded and have long-term inmates in, and not in good situation. Paroled a bunch of people without any rehabilitation. And so we were asked by the state to try to create a statewide program of uh, our work. Well, in one of our, our prisons, where we've been the longest, on one of the yards, the, one of our inmates created his own theatre company doing our work. So uh, they created a class every Friday night with a sponsor. They've been doing it for two years. 
They work like we do, four hours, no break. They've, done, they've created three plays. We don't do plays with them, we workshop with them. But they themselves have created three plays. They made 25 Commedia dell'arte masks. They're doing another play we're going to see in January. And through doing this, they've really you know, had to learn things like conflict resolution, and they changed the culture in the prison through creating this theater company. So Tim and I looked at that, and we were like, well, this now we need to expand, and this is a good way to expand. So our idea is, you know, I'm going to write a manual in all my spare time, and um, then we're going to go and train the inmates in different prisons in California for like an intensive 10 days, four hours a day, to kind of emulate the 10-week session we might have with them in a very short amount of time, and train a sponsor locally, because we can't get to those prisons every week. And then we'll go back and visit and watch and you know, license them, basically, so they can do, renew their license every year if they're keeping the integrity of the work. And so then we were also asked by the Attorney General to do a nationwide expansion. But all this is you know, a big thing to do. It's an experiment. We don't know if it will work. We never know if anything's going to work. We just try. But it's you know, an urgent situation. Now we just passed Prop 47. Yay, in California. That <laughs> yeah. we everybody worked very, very hard on passing. But there's a bunch of people coming out, and we have to make sure that they come out prepared to work. And in the next five years, we will also have a re-entry program where we have some of our inmates that have been doing the work quite a long time who will become teachers, which is going to be a very exciting next step. Great. So. I would like to give people in the audience a chance to ask questions, but just very quickly, Angelica, where are you these days? What's your life like? Well, um, I know I was actually a teacher, a teaching artist with the Changing Voices program. So even though they had participants that were my age, I was a staff member and it was, you know, leading a good example of professionalism and it was very, very rewarding. And I'm very excited to have the program start up again and to go back as a teaching artist there. Great. Um, questions from the audience? Please. Anybody? Um, here in the front, I can see. So the, the question was about research studies? Yeah, we've had, um, well, we do a lot of um, our own data collection, and we've, not any big research studies, because it's kind of hard, and because we work with juveniles, before this you could not follow them outside of, it was confidential. So we do sort of research on the effects of the program as it is. We don't, have not had the ability to follow them for a long period after. But this new Changing Voices program will change that. And we have an effectiveness study, because um, like you say, until we, we were state funded this year for the first time in eight years, we've had public money after a lot, a lot of hard work. So before that, we weren't able to get any numbers at all from the state. They wouldn't give us anything. But now they fund us. Now they have to have proof, so now they have to give us numbers. So we're at the beginning of doing three studies. Um, we have this effectiveness one. One is a recidivism study, which Recidivism is a whole another topic we can talk about for three years, what it means and what it doesn't mean. And we're doing an a in-prison violent infraction study from our people and people who don't do our programs. And then we're doing a comparative study between program, uh, yards that have our programs and similar yards that don't. Uh, I should also say we have eight years of anecdotal evidence. And the issue is, you know, number, the recidivism number is the only thing that matters in this country right now. You're trying to measure right brain activities with left brain measurements. You know, we have to find a way that this eight years mountain of evidence means something <laughs> in comparison to this you know, not small number of recidivism. Right now, we're not there. But if we are going to honor the arts and the power of the arts for transformation, we have to measure differently. And that's a very big and very, very difficult thing to do. I talked to a lot of politicians. Yeah. They don't love it. <laughs> the other thing is that recidivism, I mean, everybody asks, can you reduce recidivism? Da, da, da. If you work with juveniles, 49% of them are locked up on violations of probation and parole. So it has nothing to do with committing another crime. Most of the kids that we work with commit one crime, and then they may spend their entire teenage life through 21, going back because they had a fight with their mother, they left the place where they were paroled to, they didn't go to school. 
all the kind of things that you would not be incarcerated for if you did it as you know, someone who had not previously committed a crime. So one of the things that happens is that you end up incarcerating these kids. I had a girl that had stolen a car when she was 15. At the age of 20, she was reincarcerated after having been reincarcerated for several times. She had a six-month-old baby. Her crime was that she had run off with her boyfriend. And so she was unable to see her child because they weren't married. I mean, it just creates all kinds of stuff. I mean, that is the real picture of who is incarcerated. It is not like they're out committing crimes all the time. You have a lot of juveniles who are becoming institutionalized because that is the system. And the same in the adult prison. You go back to prison if you kill somebody or if you cross state lines to go to a funeral. Same thing. It's still a ding in recidivism, which is insane. You know, $47,000 a year to incarcerate somebody in California for crossing state lines to go to a funeral. It's ridiculous. Here. I have been curious how you recruit and train your teaching artists who work in the prison population. So the question is about recruiting and training the people who work in the program. Well, we look for people who, artists who are really interested in, in not just having a job, you know, on the side to make money while they pursue their careers. We're looking for people who are really interested in doing the work, and then we do a lot of training with them. We also, um, because of the high degree of trauma that our kids have faced, we do trauma training. We have a psychologist who trains and actually comes to our regular training sessions to talk about issues of, you know, symptoms, how do you recognize what the behavior of kids you know, is, and how do you recognize trauma symptoms instead of just assuming that someone's a bad kid? Um, and we have on-site therapists that come out with us. So for us, you have to be a member of the Actors Gang to be a teacher right now with us. So because you tra we train in our, you know, very specific style of acting. Um, but we've, for years, we've had people asking, offering. So we've had some people intern with us doing the data work. But to be a teacher, this is what we're trying to do with our expansion, to be able to train other artists or sponsors to be able to do this work. But it's, we're at the beginning for that. I don't know how it's going to work. It's exciting. <laughs> She's been raising her hand. I have two questions. One relates to these programs sound amazing. They also sound resource, um, like there are a lot of resources that go into them. So my first question is, how are they scalable? Um, my second question is relating to recidivism, which is sort of the data that everybody wants and needs. How does one even get close to measuring that when there are multiple variables that relate to recidivism? Well, I think for us in the Changing Voices program, I mean, one thing that has been shown is that if somebody stays out for a year, that they are highly unlikely to be reincarcerated. And so if you put them in a program immediately upon release, so you're not throwing them off in, they're thrown back out into the same dysfunctional, violent neighborhoods that they came from and with no resources. So you have to provide resources and you have to connect these kind of programs into the system itself. So we're now working with the Department of Juvenile Justice that they would actually plan before someone gets out that they will join our Changing Voices program, they will have a job, they will be part of this, which also will help them to get into, there's a lot of um, shelters, you know, and TLPs, living programs, where they're not willing to take kids sometimes, and especially girls because they run away. And so I was talking to the director the other day, I was like, well, you know, if we hooked up together and they knew they were coming into our program, I bet we could convince them to take these kids. Yeah, I mean, I think as far as recidivism goes, the problem is politicians don't really want people to know <laughs> what recidivism is made up of. And like right now in California, we have an attorney general who wants the recidivism to be every single arrest made. They want that to be recidivism. And we have a governor who only wants violent crimes where you go back into prison. So there's this argument happening right now, which is great, because it means people are talking about it finally. But politicians respond to the public. So Tim and I are trying to get the conversation started. We do a lot of publicity to try to get this conversation started because otherwise nobody cares. They just say, oh, California has 65%. Oh, well, recidivism. What, no one's asking what does that mean. So we're trying to be like, you know, look, this means something ridiculous. <laughs> so yeah. Oh, and your other question was about? 
It's about scaling up. Um, mm -hmm. How do you scale up programs like this? We've talked a little bit about that, but um, are there resources, public resources out there? You mentioned the first time you're, you're getting funds from the state in eight yes. years. Yes, so you have to, um, our program isn't very expensive, but you know, for four years we volunteered, and now I insist on paying teachers because they're actors, so they're generally not rich. <laughs> um, and then we have the makeup, that's you know, quite a big expense, and we give them books and pens, that's about it. Um, we have really generous funding right now from the Ford Foundation for a planning grant we have from them. The Roddick Foundation just funded us for the second time. Rosenthal Family Foundation, and then the Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation. And then, you know, people care. I find like the public care. So we have a lot of people who give us smaller amounts, who really are, are invested in changing the prison industrial complex. So I feel like you have to have everything. Up until this year, it was only public donations and then a few foundations. But yeah, I think people, you know, foundations want to see change. That's what they're about and people want to see change, so they will invest. We also partner with a lot of organizations, so when we realized the amount of trauma that we were dealing with on the daily basis for the kids that had just gotten out, so we are now, we had our own trauma people, but we realized that they really need to have this, you know, one-on-one -on -one counseling, and so, so we have meetings with the University of Illinois um, Trauma Coalition. They're figuring out how to send their students out, so I think you just have to keep looking for all of the people, and we belong to the Illinois Children's Trauma Coalition. We're the only arts group that's part of that. So there's actually, I mean, I, that's what I said to them is, you know, and I mean, it's like, we need this help. And they immediately started looking for who would be a good partner for us. So I have to just keep pushing people. You know, like, you know, I just have been at the Capitol twice in the last month, like really talking to politicians and being, you know, we want this to be a line item in the budget next year. And it should be, because this is the work of the state. And by the way, you're about to get sued again, so you might want to do something about it. And it's a very small amount of money. They call it budget dust. Yeah. <laughs> We're getting down to the last minute. Maybe one last question here. So I think the, the programs are clearly important and well designed in, in, in tackling all of the problems that need to be tackled. Um, and having worked in the New York City public school system for 25 years in, in these populations, I'm always I always go back to how do we stop them from getting there in the first place? Mm -hmm. and, and questions of scalability and investment in communities. And it is so important. And it is working with the adult actors in the community because they are just as screwed as the kids are. Um, no one's ever, we've never found a way to get them to tell their stories. You know, and in little bits and pieces it happens. But changing the, the, the culture of the community, I mean, I just spent four years in East New York putting a theater program into a public school. And, um, and it's the same thing. It's, it's stupid stuff like, you know, missing your parole or getting in a fight with a parent. It gets these kids thrown out of school or in mm -hmm. detention and then they're hanging out on the streets and then they're, you know, they're, they're with a gang or somebody gets killed and, and they have no outlet for that emotion and so they do something stupid. And the parents and the caregivers are in no position to help them because they are it's part of the, the, the you know, the call, not just, it's not want to say it's the culture, because that's kind of blaming the victim. It is, there are no resources for these people. They are not, you know, uh, people who say, oh, well, they all have cell phones, so they have resources. If they can afford a cell phone, then they should be able to X, Y, and Z. And so, so they are really disposable people in this culture. I mean, and we're getting... how, do we, how do we deal with that? And these are fabulous. Programs, but I think about what you're doing with the juveniles who are already incarcerated. We could get to them in middle school and high school. Mm -hmm. But we, uh, yeah, we and we are working on that. And I sit on the um, advisory board for the juvenile detention center. I was appointed by the county commissioners, and they are really looking at, you know, basically taking all the juveniles out of detention who shouldn't be there, which is most of them, and putting centers in the community. So I think that the bigger picture that we're all working towards is not incarcerating so many kids and kids in general and giving programs in the community and taking the kind of programs that we do. I mean, I to say that I've had kids say, um, you know, when we take them to theater for the first time, oh, other people do this? Because mm -hmm. <laughs> they think the theater that they have done is the only 
thing that exists because they have never seen it. They have no resources. They haven't seen it. And we just have to work away at you know multiplying what we're doing. And the reason our Changing Voices crew goes out into the community is they are being taught to be mentors, and that is a strange thing for them to hear that they could be mentors, that they that all younger kids could look up to them, that they could lead discussions. Um, and it's you know you just keep infiltrating all the community organizations and. You know, I, I think you can't get overwhelmed. You just have to keep working really hard. I was wondering if I could maybe just sort of reformulate that question to both of you as a, as a final question, and that is, if you look at the continuum from working with youth at risk to working with kids and people who are in detention to dealing with the question of how do those people come out and find a life and negotiate a system that's permanently stacked against them, where would you put the resources? I mean, where is there a clear crisis point that needs to be tackled first in this Continue on. Well, at the Actors Gang, we have an education program as well that's been going longer than the prison project. We work in elementary, middle, and high school. Uh, in California, there's no arts in the in the core curriculum in public schools. My son is in the. Huh? Right. Right. So it, my son is in the number one school in LAUSD, and that he will go from sixth through twelfth with no arts at all in the school. So what are we considering as success? Um, <laughs> but we have had you know, this program for many years at the Actors Gang, elementary, middle, and high school. We have an after-school program in our theater for the local uh, school as well. We work, we've worked with at-risk kids in LAUSD. We're part of Youth Policy Institute in, in uh, LA. We also have an on and off program at Homeboy Industries, which is for people who are at risk for going into gangs and parolees. So, you know, we're a tiny company, a tiny 501c3, 99-seat theater company. And, you know, there's very big theater companies in L.A. who are not doing half of the amount. So we are, you know, we are training people, people who join the Actors Gang, to be people who are conscious and are taking action in society. Nearly all our people are teachers as well as actors. So I feel like you just have to be an example and just hope that other organizations want to do it too. Whether they do or not, we'll do it. We'll do it if we don't get any money. We've done it for many years as volunteers. Now we're in a position we can actually pay people, but we have to do it with those kind of people that we have to do it because what else, what's the alternative? You know, these are our children. <laughs> so um, yes, we, we uh, you know, we're trying to cover all the bases and do it linked to the stage. You know, so it's, we are always artists first. Right. And it's the same with us. I mean, we're trying to, yeah, obviously we're trying to spread our organization throughout the state of Illinois and to then make it replicable to other states, um, which I think is really important. And along the way, we try to pull in every organization that we touch, whether they're health organizations or, and we get money from, because we do, because we are trauma informed and because we have that, that we get money from health, public health organizations as well. Um, but you know, we are constantly asking, the, you know, will you give tickets to our kids for free so that we can bring everybody out to the other arts organizations? And I think that it has become more of a part of their consciousness too. Yeah, and I mean, I really feel strongly about, you know, people often say to us, oh, why do those guys deserve it? How come you're doing it in prison? And what about my kid who's at school? Or especially the officers will say that a lot. And we're going to have a training program for them eventually. So, but I, I feel like, yeah, yes, your kid should have it. And what are you doing about it? I'm busting my butt right now, working seven <laughs> days a week to try to do this. But what are you doing? I'm glad you feel passionately about it. Please go talk to your politicians. Please create a program. That's what we did. I don't think you can just pinpoint one population. You have to connect people and educate people. And I think that what happens when we bring in, because we bring in the community and parents and our board members, some of whom are here, are great about, I mean, they go and pick the people up to get them. You know, we have kids. I had a girl, we just closed a show on Sunday, and there was a girl who had not seen her mother for two years. And everybody was like, oh, you know, her mother's really not going to come again. And, and then the mother did, you know, and it's because of the way that we go after. And what will happen to that mother that then came to see the show is that she will see a different view of her child and she will come again. I picked up um, some relatives of another one of the kids and they were like, 
oh my God, it's really not very far from Chicago to come out here. It's straight out and it's because they have these barriers and you have to just keep breaking down barriers and making people see that all of our kids are worthwhile. And it's important to, you know, I think we all find our segment of whatever it is that we need to focus on and work with and I've been doing this for 30 years and, you know, that's what it is. 30 more. Uh, there's a reception afterwards, so maybe we can continue the conversation out there informally. Well, now I'd like to uh, thank Sabra Williams and Joe Garcia. And Lee Paul and, and I want to thank Phil Kennicott uh, for your sensitive moderation. Thank you, Phil. And just, just to redirect and synthesize a couple of comments quickly, there was discussion about resources and what things can happen and what, what should be focused on at what particular moments. I would say, first of all, about the resources, never forget that we are a resource, as you just said. People in this room are a resource, and the purpose of, a, of an event like this is to encourage this resource, to light fire under all of you, to go forward and take what you've heard here today and find your own ways forward with it, whether it's helping directly, indirectly, through information, through, through means, whatever's necessary. Because it really does happen, just like that. It happens in a small room. That's how it happens. Uh, the other thing I'd say is that we've talked about artistic practices, but we didn't actually talk about artistic practices in terms of what we watched Angelica do was perfect. She was working on it, working on not only a performance, but working on communicating. And that's what these, these programs also do. They apply artistic habits to societal problems. And when we talk about collaboration with all the different players that we've heard about tonight, these are artistic habits. And we should encourage those everywhere we can in our artistic organizations because it's a unique, a unique ability. It's a unique quality that you don't see everywhere. You do not have that urge that you saw her doing in her performance that applies actually to the way you do business. It's a really incredible thing to be able to, to encourage. Uh, so obviously, we wish both of you and your organizations incredible success as you expand. Uh, and uh, Angelica, congratulations, and thank you so much for sharing your work and your story with us. Thank you all for coming.